want to welcome everyone who might be joining us right now on Facebook Live or on YouTube, whether you're doing that live or whether you're, you're watching it at another time. I'm so glad you're joining with us today. Uh, we are in a series we're calling A Heart for God. Uh, before we get started with that, I want to make a quick little announcement. Uh, this Wednesday night, um, we're starting a new Bible study. Our, our uh, pastor's Bible study will begin uh, to study the Apostle Paul. And from 6 to 6.30 uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to start a six weeks. Uh, study looking at the kind of the few things about Paul. One, just kind of his background is a this week we're going to talk about Paul as a Pharisee and then kind of Paul as a persecutor and then Paul as an apostle. And you know, the apostle Paul wrote a quarter of our New Testament, but if you had asked him before <laughs> he did any of that, uh, he would have told you that he's the most unlikely person in the world to have actually become a Christian and then even more unlikely to have become uh, the most influential Christian in the history of the world. And so we're going to study about him, and then we're going to look at his three uh, missionary journeys that became the origin of the 13 letters that we have in our New Testament, and how in just 10 years, uh, he managed literally to, through the power of the Spirit, to change the world. And so if you're, if you're interested in learning more about Paul, uh, 30 minutes, six weeks, we're going to start this, this Wednesday night, and you can find more on our website, fbcwax.org forward slash, this is going to be hard, Paul. So, all right, well, today we're going to continue to talk about having a heart for God. And, you know, uh, the passage that we're in here in the seventh chapter of Mark's gospel is, that's what Jesus is talking about. You know, he's been, he's been so successful in his ministry, uh, crowds are following him, largely because he's doing miracles and people are showing up to get miracles. And as these enormous crowds come to him, the the other religious leaders of the day, particularly the Pharisees, see that and they're not real happy about the fact that Jesus is drawing these crowds because Jesus is teaching and doing things that's different than what they're teaching and doing. And in the seventh chapter of Mark's gospel, they, they come down from Jerusalem to have this encounter with Jesus and it gives rise to this whole this whole series of questions in this passage about, hey, Jesus, how come you and your disciples don't follow our rituals and rules associated with what we believe is important, these oral laws and traditions that, that they've come up with on their own, but they think are so important to being, to being really religious. And Jesus just cuts through all of that. And he tells them that their, their problem is that their focus is on the outside, and God is focused on the heart. And that's the title of this series, Having a Heart for God. And I just want to say right at the beginning of this, you know, kind of study together today, you know, it's possible that, that we've sung some songs today, and, and, you know, we've kind of, we've kind of been singing them, or maybe we've kind of gathered around the book today, and, and we can do that with words, and we can do that with some, but not do it with our heart. And, you know, God is interested in our heart, and God is looking at our heart today. And so let's think about that as we, uh, as we look at this passage. And so as Jesus w w walks through this conversation, he's moving things in the direction away from where their focus is, which is on the outside, and he begins to talk about what really defiles us. And that's the title of our message today, What Defiles You? And we're just going to read three verses uh, Mark 20, 21, 22, 23, four verses. And so if you will pick up there with me in verse 20. It says, he, he went on, <laughs> he continued to talk to them. What comes out of a person, he says, the word person, anthropos in Greek, we get our word anthropology from that, it, it means human being. What comes out of a, what comes out of a human being is what defiles them. The people that he's talking to have a different perspective. They think it's what's on the outside. Jesus says, it's actually what comes out of you that defiles you. The word defile is a word we all know. In Greek, it's the word coin. And a coin was something that was common. It was common currency. There's another word that's used sometimes that we know it's the word vulgar. And that also just means common. And so the idea here is, is what makes something common, what, what would otherwise be spiritual or religious or used for God, what, what just makes it just 
ordinary or vulgar, what defiles it, Jesus says, it's, it's not what's on the outside, it's, it's what comes, from, comes out of a person. And then in verse 21, he continues, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And he begins to name here, this is a, we call this a vice list, it's a, it's a moral list of things that, that, that come out of a person, and he names them sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and greed and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy and slander and arrogance and folly. And then he makes this statement, he says, all these evils come from inside. And defile a person. Now, if you've been sort of trekking with us through this series, you kind of know exactly what we're talking about today, but perhaps you haven't, or maybe you just need to kind of a little bit of a reminder. So let me just kind of walk us through what Jesus is saying here. So we really are all kind of on the same, kind of on the same page. Because what Jesus is talking about in this passage and, and what he's what he's building so that these religious people, they don't, they don't understand, and he wants them to understand, and he wants his disciples to understand, and he wants us to understand today, is simply this. Is he answers our question, what defiles you, by saying, what defiles you comes from what's inside of you. you know, it's common for us today to kind of look at the world and go, man, the world is so bad, and this is so bad, and that is so bad. But what, what the Bible's telling us is, what's really so bad is not always out there that it comes from what's in here. It's a word for that, it's called insidious. It's, it's inside of us, but that's not the way they're thinking about this. And so just to kind of review and take you back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, let's, let's take a look at verses one through four of Mark seven. We can put these on the screen. It says, this is the setting of all of this. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and. They saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. Now, you, I want to remind you, if you, don't, if you weren't here, that that doesn't mean their hands were dirty. It, it, it refers to the, to the religious understanding of defilement. In other words, their hands had come in contact with something or someone that was not religious. That is, unwashed. That often, if they, they bumped in bumped into a Gentile or something like that, then that would be defiling to them. The Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. And I explained that before. It's, it's kind of like when you're a kid and mom or dad says, go wash your hands, it's time for dinner, and you know the kid walks in the bathroom and turns it on and just kind of does like that. You know, You didn't sing the ABCs or whatever you're supposed to do. Happy birthday or whatever to you know use all of the bacteria cleansing stuff. You just did this. You just gave it a little. But that's what they did. They would give. They would do a ceremonial washing. It was just a, a religious thing, and and that's what the passage tells us that that is their concern. And it says they're holding to the tradition of the elders, which in other words, it's not in the Bible. This is just their own tradition. And then it says when they come from the marketplace, that's where you went to buy goods. And when you were there, you would bump into people who were, who were Gentiles. And so when you come from the market, you, you, you should give yourself a little ceremonial washing. They do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. Now, it's, it's possible that as I'm talking about this, you're not really kind of getting in your mind what's the concern. And so one of the things I did last, uh, a few weeks ago is I showed this picture. We can put it on the screen of these, these are stone jars that were used at the time of Jesus. Uh, these are archaeologically discovered, and they are the kind of stones that were used for this kind of thing. And they're literally carved out of stone, and stone containers were considered ritually pure. Jar, jars made out of clay were not. And, and if you're trying to, like, in your mind, kind of get an understanding of this, you might think back to the first miracle of Jesus. It's the miracle of Cana and Galilee when he was coming to the wedding, and they're there for a little bit, and they run out of wine. And Jesus' mother, Mary, comes to him and says, you know, do something about it. And he's like, what do you want me to do about it? And Jesus will do a miracle. And you know what he did. This is what it says. I'm just going to read it to you. It says in John 2, 6, 
nearby stood six stone water jars. Notice all the significance of that, six stone water jars. The kind, it says, used by Jews for ceremonial washing. Each of them was holding between 20 and 30 gallons of water. Now, these aren't quite large enough for that, but that gives you the picture of what was happening. These Jewish people had within their homes um, containers of water that could be used for the purpose of the ceremonial washing. And this was on everyone's mind. This is how you kept yourself from being defiled. And Jesus walks onto the stage of history. And he says, I'm going to tell you something, folks. What defiles you doesn't come from outside of you. It comes from what's inside of you. Your problem is not out here. Your problem is in here. And then he, he even defines the location of it because you're kind of like, well, if it's an inside problem, where in my body is the problem? Is the problem my eyes? Is the problem my ears? Is the problem my hands? What's the problem? What part of my anatomy is the concern? And Jesus says, it starts with your heart. Now, he doesn't mean the pulsating organ in your chest that's pumping blood through your body. He is describing the concept that runs through all of Scripture, the, the seed of human emotions, the, the heart of our motivation. When, when we ask somebody, do you mean it in your heart? We don't mean, do you mean it in... We mean, do you mean it? Do you really mean it? It comes from the deeper part of who you are. And what Jesus is saying about these religious people is he's saying, they're doing all this stuff out here, but none of it is coming from inside of here. And he'll finally say to them in the sixth verse of this chapter, Mark 7, he replied, we put it on the screen, Isaiah, the prophet of the Old Testament, was right when he prophesied about you, you hypocrites, you mask wearers. That's what it means, people who put on the mask, that they're one thing, but on the inside there's something else. He says, it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Go back and read Isaiah, and he'll say, they're, 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 with their mouth they're close to me, but with their heart they're far from me. The problem, he says, starts with your heart. But then Jesus goes on to say that that's not all. He goes on to say, for it is from within out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. And here Jesus introduces us to something that we need to understand today. That it's not just what's coming, starting from what's in our heart. But it is what is developing in our thoughts or in our mind. Uh, th th this is a really important thing because in order to, to understand what defiles us, we have to understand that it doesn't just start in our heart, it develops in our mind. It develops here inside of our head. Now, for a lot of us, we live in a world where when we talk about the mind, we have this sort of idea in our, mi in our mind that the mind is kind of this pure place of reason and ration. And if I can just reason it all out and mathematically figure it all out, I can get to a perfect conclusion. That whole idea comes from a French philosopher about 400 years ago named Rene Descartes. And he gives us analytical thinking and analytical thought. Rene Descartes was the guy who got, the legend says, got inside of a stove that wasn't on and sat in there and tried to figure out the ground of all truth. Like, what is the basic truth that I can build all truth on? And he sat in there and sat in there until he finally came to this phrase in Latin, cogito ergo sum. Cogito means I think, ergo means therefore, sum means I am. It's the, I, 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 I know that I exist, and from that basis of the fact that I exist, I then use reason and ration, Descartes said, to build all of the understanding of everything. If, if, if I can devise it in my mind, then I know that it is true. And a lot of people since then, and that's, that was the rise of what we call modernity and the age of reason, and the Western world is completely built on this idea. The only problem is, 
The Bible is not. And the Bible tells us that our reason and our ration and our thinking are always fundamentally corrupted. And that by our own thinking and by our own mind, we cannot arrive at the conclusion of truth because truth doesn't come from inside of our mind, it comes from outside of our mind. It is a revelation that comes from God. In fact, what's inside of our mind is a place that is broken and therefore we need to renew the mind. When Paul talks about the mind, he uses uh, another metaphor. He describes it as like a battlefield. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the war world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, if you don't know a stronghold, in the, in the ancient world, the way you did war is you built a place that was fortified, and that's how you withstood a military attack. But people devised means to bring down strongholds. They would use catapults that would launch boulders and, and shatter walls, and they would siege over the walls, and they had devised all sorts of methods. And what Paul says, he says that on the contrary, the weapons we fight with they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. Folks, we are living in a world that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And in a lot of our lives, whether we realize it or not, the enemy has placed strongholds there that need to be brought down and the weapons that we fight that with are the weapons that are going to happen in our mind and they are the weapons that God gives us. And what he says in that passage is, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience and once your obedience is complete, he says, you are judging by appearances. And as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he's saying the same thing that Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. You guys are focused on the outside. You're focused on the appearance. You're focused on what it looks like. But the real battle is going on in here and in here. And you're never going to win the battle if you think it's out here when the battle is really in here and it's in here. Paul writes to the Philippians and he says this in Philippians 2.5. He says, in your relationships with one another... Have the same, the old translation says, has this, have the same mind as Christ. Some translations say, have the same attitude. Then the newest NIV says, have the same mindset. Have the mind of Christ. Why? Why should I have the mind of Christ? Because the mind that I have is corrupted. I need another mind. I don't need to just think more clearly. I need the mind of Christ. I need a download of a new mind. And this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed, be metamorphosized by the renewal or renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. These Pharisees, these religious people, they had all these rules, but what they didn't realize is they needed a new mindset. They needed a new way to think about it, and that new way to think about it would come from Jesus. You know, this, this idea runs through the whole New Testament. In, in the book of Romans, Paul says in Romans 8, 5, that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Can I just ask you a question today? Where's your mind set on? Where's your mind set to? What is it tuned into? What is it set on? When Paul wrote to the Philippians in the third chapter, he described the God of the age, and he says, the people who follow him, he says, their destiny is destruction. This is Philippians 3.19. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Folks, I'll be honest with you. I look at our world today, 
And a lot of what I see people being real proud of is real shameful. Their glory, their pride is really shameful. Their mind, Paul says, is set on earthly things. And then you go to that passage in Colossians chapter 3 where Paul's writing in that third chapter. He says something that I think is really helpful here. He says, this is Colossians 3, 1 through 3. He says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts, hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he says this. Set your minds on things above. Not on earth, earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What's Paul talking about? He is talking about the transformation that's supposed to happen in our lives as our hearts and our minds are changed, as they're renewed, as they're transformed. And it better be the case because the battle is not out here. The battle is in here and the battle is here. And then Jesus says, it is it is what starts here and develops here that results in this. It results in sin. Uh, you know, it's one, of those, it's one of those funny things. The only place you ever hear about sin is at church, right? Turn on the television and watch shows. There are very few times that people will say the problem is sin. I can think of never having heard that. You know, you don't watch the news in the evening and it says, today there, were, there was this really bad sin in Chicago when they murdered someone. It, things are given different labels in our culture. But in the Bible, these things are given this label. It says, it says that what comes from our heart and our mind, these evil thoughts result in these things. And then Jesus begins to list them. And he starts with sexual immorality. The Greek is porneia. And it defines any sexual sexuality that is out of the context of, our, of marriage. And you, know, you, you start to read these lists and you start realizing, man, there's a lot of people that are okay with that in the world that we live in. And there's a lot of people even in the church world that are kind of like, you know, that's not that big of a deal. But Jesus seems to think it is. And then he lists three in a row that you'll find in an Old Testament book, in an Old Testament list. I'll give you a hint, there's 10 of them. Theft, murder, and adultery. And those aren't a shocker to us, but look what he then says. If you've got your Bible, you can see this in verse 22. He says, and then he starts to name things. He says, greed. And I read that to myself, and I look at our world today, and I think, our world is in love with greed. The culture that we are in is all about the money. Jesus described greed as an idolatry. He said you can't serve God and mammon. You have to make a choice. You can't make them both. Greed is idolatry. It's another God. And it, and it culminates from the heart and from evil thoughts. And then he mentions malice and deceit. Our culture loves deceit. You don't have to watch very many movies or see very many programs to know that deceit is very much a part of the culture we live in. Lewdness. The entire, it's kind of going from preaching to meddling, but the whole fashion industry is built on lewdness, isn't it? And then he mentions envy. Watch any television commercial. It's built on the idea of, you're, you, don't you want this? If you could just have this. Slander. That's saying something that's not true about someone else to bring them down. Hello, social media. That's kind of what it's built off of these days. And then he mentions arrogance. And we've never lived in a time where more people are more arrogant and needed more humility. And then he says folly. And folly is a life of foolishness. It is a life without divine direction. It is a life that ends in ruin. It is a life without purpose with God. And he lists this, and he's, he's not saying this is like the end-all, be-all list. He's just saying, hey, these things come. They're, they're, they're not out here. They start in here. 
And if we're going to stop those things out here, we're going to have to deal with what's going on in here and what's going on up here. Now, all through the Bible, we run into these vice lists. The most famous one is the one we call the Ten Commandments. And I thought I'd go ahead and have them put up on the screen. These are the, uh, you know, this is the official one. It's in Jerusalem. Joe. There's no official version of it that we have in existence, but we do have it written in a book, and it's called the Bible. And, you know, I talk a lot about the Ten Commandments, but I thought, you know, maybe today I just should read it. Now, this is an edited version of it because I didn't want to read all of Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, but it says, these are the ten. These are the big ten. I'm the Lord your God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill or murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Wouldn't it be nice if someone had just simplified that so we don't have to remember all 10? I mean, that's kind of a big list. What if there was a way we could simplify it down into just two? Oh, that's right. There is somebody who did that, and his name was Jesus. And when they asked him what are the most important laws, he said there's two. And if you took that 10 and you boiled everything in the 10 down, it would be these two things. One, he said, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. It's called the Shema of the, of, of the Jewish people. It's Deuteronomy 6.4. It's, it's the prayer that's prayed every day. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He's a had in Hebrew. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That is the vertical relationship that God wants to be in place. That is the vertical relationship that needs to be in place in our life, that we love God above everything else, that he is our God, that we're devoted to him, that we have no other God. And then the other, Jesus said, commandment is like it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus 19, 18. And if you were to boil the entire law and the entire Bible down into two simple instructions, it would be that God wants that vertical relationship to exist with him and then the horizontal relationship that needs to exist with each other. In fact, the Bible says that if I say I love God, but I hate my neighbor, I am a liar and the truth is not in me. Living in relationship with God means that I love other people, some people I don't even like. But that is part of what it means to live in proper relationship with God. But here's the thing I want you to picture in your mind. If this vertical relationship is right, and this horizontal relationship is right, there's a center point. And the center point is not in Jerusalem. It is in your heart. It is where everything aligns in your life and in this world. And if your heart is right with God and your heart was right with each other, then everything else is going to work. But here's the thing. If your heart is not right with God today, then none of the rest of it is ever going to work. That's why Jesus keeps saying in this passage, it's a, from the heart, it's about the heart. You know, when when David sinned in the Old Testament, famously committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband Uriah, he really felt bad about it. I mean, he really did. He wrote a whole chapter in the Bible called Psalm 51. And he, and he says to God in that prayer, he says, God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my iniquities against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And then he says this in Psalm 51. He says, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Well, you know what? We all need new hearts, and we all need renewed minds, and we all need the mind of Christ. And the good news of the gospel is, is it doesn't matter how many of these things that we've done wrong, the Bible tells us, the prophet Isaiah says this, that your sins, though they're as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. 
It doesn't matter what you've done. He'll take your sin and he'll put it in the, in the deepest part of the ocean as far as the east is from the west. So far he will remove your sins from you. Corey Ten Boom says he'll take your sins away and he'll put them in the deepest part of the ocean and he'll put up a sign that says no fishing. He can do that today. He's in the cleansing business. You see, the, the problem of the Pharisees is they didn't have a way to solve that problem. They were cleansing the vessels, but Jesus Christ can cleanse the heart today. Jesus can purify the heart. He can purify the mind. You know, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He'll forgive you. And you know what else it says? He will katharizo. He will purify you from unrighteousness. He will cleanse your heart. He will cleanse your mind. Only he can do that. But for that to happen, you and I need to have a heart for God. Let's pray together. And Father, we just uh, pause here at the end of this message and in this time. And just, Lord, I, my prayer right now is for each one of us to realize the importance of this in our lives. God, my, my, my prayer today is that we would shift our attention from the external right now into the heart. And Lord, we all need cleansed hearts. And we all need minds that are renewed and transformed. It's not like some of us do and some of us don't. We all need that. God, I pray the prayers of Jeremiah the prophet that says, turn my heart of stone into a heart of flesh. I pray the prayer of David today, create in me a new heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And God, I pray that, that if, our, if any of us here today would know that our relationship with you is not what it should be, that we are not loving you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, that God, right now, we would acknowledge that, we would confess that. And God, I pray for, for anyone here today whose relationship with other people is not what it should be. God, I pray that you would help us here in this moment to do what needs to be done in that regard. And God, I pray that above all things, that at the center of all this, God, that you today, you would do what you need to do in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name.